hi all welcome to the video so this is the first lecture for ca intermediate indirect tax that is gst so this is the initial pages of the study material which is given by ica intermediate course module one of two paper for taxation section b indirect tax relevant for may 20 and november 20 examinations okay so for ca intermediate students paper number four of group one is divided into two the so one is income tax and second one is gst and if you see the initial pages we can understand that income tax is for section a income tax is for 60 marks and section b that is indirect taxes is for 40 marks so today from today onwards we will be discussing about the indirect tax 40 marks so out of this indirect taxes what intermediate students are required to learn is only gst customs is not included in your intermediate topic whereas customs is included in the ca final topic so in this indirect tax what we have to learn is one concept of indirect tax and two gst talk so exclusively gst is in your syllabus so in this gst what is there so if you see the contents there are actually 10 chapters this is actually um, module one's initial page so actually there are 10 chapters so first chapter is gst in india and introduction so in this lecture we will be understanding the basic concepts of gst what is gst why is gst introduced so what are the contents in gst that we will be learning in this lecture so i will take the first chapter okay so this is the chapter one gst in india and introduction so what are the things that you are going to learn in this chapter so we know that there are two types of taxes one is direct tax and the other one is indirect tax so for example i am a person i am a salaried employee i am getting say monthly fifty thousand income so this monthly fifty thousand is directly received by me from my employer and for this income i will be paying tax to the government and i will be paying it directly to the government and that is actually direct tax and i received this say for 50000 say after tax i received 45000 rupees so after getting 45000 in my pocket what i will do say i will go for shopping say i went to a supermarket or i went to a shop and i purchased an item Say for example, I purchased a dress. Okay, dress. So while purchasing this dress, on the price of this dress, I will be paying a small amount as tax. So I am the end consumer. I am paying tax on purchasing. So earlier income tax was on my income but here in direct tax is on my expenditure on my consumption on my payment so while paying the paying for my purchase paying for the dress i pay the tax also whether i pay it to the government no i pay it to the supplier who is the supplier so the textile shop owner and what he will do with that money he will pay it to the government i earlier in the income tax we saw that we received the salary on that salary we pay tax directly to the government but here we pay it to we, okay. 
we pay it to the supplier and now the textile shop owner or the supplier he will pay this amount on behalf of us to the government he will not be paying it from his pocket whereas he collected from us and he will be paying it to the government and finally the burden of paying tax remains with the end consumer that means i who purchased the dress so this is the basic difference between income tax and gst so on this chapter chapter 1 gst in india and introduction what we will be learning explain the concept of tax and the objective for its levy then describe the concept of direct and indirect tax and the difference between both the taxes then what are the features of indirect tax then what is the concept of gst then how gst is framed in india and what are the benefits that is received from gst then constitutional provisions pertaining to levy so constitutional amendment has been done to introduce gst so what are those constitutional amendments then the need for this constitutional amendment why this gst was introduced earlier we had other indirect tax like we had vat service tax so the new syllabus new students will not be knowing much about the service tax and what we will be discuss that we will be discussing that then amendments made by 101st amendment act 2060 so by this 101st amendment act or the gst was introduced so what are the significant amendments in that act so these are the key outcomes key learning outcomes from this first chapter so what is basically first thing what is basically a tax so tax actually tax is levied by government right why government is levying tax government require fund government require fund for what government require fund government require fund for implementing their projects so for example government has to say we need good roads we need hospitals we need infrastructures we need education institutions so we require much benefits so in order to implement the same government require money so how do government require how do government receive this money so they receive it from the common people how do they collect it they collect it in the form of tax so tax is levied on expenditures tax is levied on incomes so tax is a pecuniary burden laid upon individuals or property owners to support the government so we are required to pay the tax to the government so why government requires support from us so why government require so government will receive the tax and they will implement the projects and we have as we have earlier discussed there are two types of taxes one is direct tax and another one is indirect tax so what is direct tax a direct tax is a kind of charge which is imposed directly on the taxpayer and paid directly to the government so as we have said i receive salary income and i pay to the government out of the salary income a small amount of tax so that is paid directly to the government what is indirect tax indirect tax if the taxpayer is just a conduit and at every stage the tax incidence is passed on till it finally reaches the consumer who really bears the brunt of it such tax is an indirect tax this statement is it is confusing so what is that stage is mentioned something known as stage is mentioned what is this stage then for example we have seen an earlier example i went into a textile shop and i purchased their dress here we have seen only one transaction but before this transaction happened there happened some other transactions also say for example say a person so a company a company using uh, a company manufactured dress or stitched dress okay so a company stitched dress so say for example they are a manufacturer they sold the same dress to a wholesaler now this wholesaler sold this dress to a retailer and me as a customer purchased it 
from the retailer so first transaction was from manufacturer to wholesaler then second transaction was from wholesaler to retailer and the third was from retailer to the end consumer so there are actually three transactions which happened now what will be the price at these three stages say for example i purchased a dress whose mrp is 2000 rupees so if you see ideally the manufacturer might have sold this item to the wholesaler maybe at 1000 rupees now this wholesaler might have sold this to the retailer for say 1300 rupees sorry say uh, the manufacturer might have sold it for 1000 now the wholesaler might have sold it to the retailer say for example for 1500 rupees now the retailer who received this for 1500 sold this product to us for 2000 rupees so three stages okay so these items are this is called a stage actually so stage one stage two stage three now what happens at stage one at stage one manufacturer sold the dress to wholesaler wholesaler paid to the manufacturer thousand rupees and also he paid a tax he paid an indirect tax okay on this thousand rupees say for example five percentage so out of thousand plus five percentage how much say 50 rupees so 50 rupees he paid as tax to he paid to the manufacturer now manufacturer collected this 50 rupees and paid it to the government now second stage in second stage this wholesaler sold it to the retailer for 1500 rupees now wall retailer paid 1500 rupees plus he paid 75 rupees say at the rate of five percentage he paid 75 rupees tax now this wholesaler received 75 rupees actually <clears throat> he paid 50 rupees now he received 75 rupees what he will do he will keep back 50 rupees out of the 70 rupees to his pocket and he will remit the balance 25 rupees what happens he keeps 50 rupees why 50 rupees that is already he has paid that is already an outflow from his pocket he keeps the 50 rupees in his pocket and he remit the balance 24 rupees to the government now how much money is received by the government 50 rupees in stage 1 and 24 rupees in stage 2 total 75 rupees government received whether the manufacturer had lost anything from his pocket no whether the wholesaler lost something is from his pocket he lost 50 rupees but he again he regained this 50 rupees whether the retailer lost any amount yes the retailer lost 75 rupees and how much is with government 75 rupees so this means this wholesaler acted as an agent between the retailer and the government he collected the 75 and he remitted 75 it is the net now what happens this retailer now sold the same goods to end consumer so for example me so he sold it for 2000 so 2000 into 5 percentage 100 rupees he collected as tax 100 rupees collected now what he will do already 75 rupees was lost from his pocket he keeps the 75 out of the 100 rupees he received he keeps the 75 in his pocket balance 25 he remitted to the government now government earlier received 75 rupees plus 25 total 100 rupees government received the retailer no loss or no profit and the end consumer he gave 100 rupees as a tax so at each stage the tax incidence is passed on so in the stage one the wholesaler paid the full amount of tax when it comes to stage two the wholesaler received back the amount and the retailer had the full tax incidence and the stage three when it comes the end consumer had all the hundred rupees tax incidence was fully on the final consumer and the retailer do not lose any amount so 
at each stage the dioxins is passed on till it finally reaches the consumer who really bear the brunt of it so the total amount total tax burden is borne by the end consumer so this is called an indirect tax so an indirect tax is one that can be shifted by the tax payer to someone else so here wholesaler retailer final end customer so tax incidence is shifted to one person on each stage indirect tax is levied on consumption expenditure privilege or right but not on income or property so we have seen on income actually direct tax is taxed and on consumption and expenditures indirect tax is levied earlier a number of indirect taxes were levied in india namely excise duty customs duty service tax cst vat entry tax state tax entertainment tax tax on lottery bid gambling luxury tax tax on advertisement etc so there were lot many indirect taxes prior to gst so however the indirect taxation witnessed a paradigm shift on 1st july 2017 from on that day what happened it has shifted to gst a simple tax so goods and service tax it has been introduced and all other indirect taxes were abolished say in fully or in partly and gst has come into existence now for all these indirect taxes it has been replaced with gst but still there are excise duty customs duty is still there then central excise duty is still levied on few products we will see that on the later chapter on the later part of this chapter at intermediate level we will study the basic concepts of gst concept of supply charge of gst exemptions time of supply value of supply tax credit registration invoice debit not credit notes returns so we have we are not familiar with these things we will come later on so taxes direct tax means person is directly paying to the government and it is progressive in nature so what do you mean by progressive whereas in indirect tax it is regressive in nature say i will give the example say for example i purchased for 100 rupees and 5% is just a tax rate how much i will pay 5 5 rupees so for example i paid i purchased for 200 rupees i pay 10% we call it as directly proportional 100 rupees 5 rupees 200 rupees 10 rupees so this is actually regressive in nature all the consumers equally bear the burden irrespective of their ability to pay so whoever purchased it for 100 rupees they pay 5 rupees who are purchased for 200 rupees they pay 10 rupees directly proportional but whereas in direct tax it is progressive in nature high rate of tax for people having higher ability to pay say for example if my income is below 2.5 lakhs to 5 lakhs i pay 5% tax if my income comes in 5 lakhs to 10 lakhs bracket my tax rate increased to 20% if it is more than 10 lakhs it is increased again to 30 percentage so this is actually progressive in nature higher the income higher it comes the tax but whereas in indirect tax it is directly proportional and again in indirect tax it is <clears throat> final burden is always with the end consumer tax incidence is shifted from one person to another in each stage okay that is indirect tax that is the main difference between direct tax and indirect tax so what are the major direct tax it is income tax and what is a major indirect tax it is gst and customs so customs we will be dealing in ca final level now what are the features of indirect taxes one point an important source of revenue okay we will and it's a play on a plain reading we can understand the points then tax on commodities and services it is levied on commodities at the time of manufacture or purchase or sale hence it is also known as commodity taxation so in direct tax we know that it is levied on consumption actually on purchase on sale it happens then shifting of burden 
so as we know at each stage the burden is shifted from one person to another no perception of direct pinch so we know that it is indirectly paid to the government then inflationary then wider tax base promotes social welfare regressive in nature these points we have already discussed now genesis of gst in india what do you mean by genesis of gst in india so the history how gst was introduced in india so these are actually we need to just understand in a very small nutshell we will just summarize it so we can see in the year 2000 this gst was actually they are planned plan they started planning about this gst in 2003 they formed a task force for studying about this gst and subsequently p chidambaram in 2006 7 announced that gst will be introduced from 1st april but still but that doesn't happen then again in 2014 india government came then 101st amendment bill was started so in parliament actually bill will be presented and this bill should be passed by both houses of parliament and after that the president will sign the bill and then it becomes actually an act so every bill may not, might not become an act so because sometimes parliament may not agree and that bill will be thrown out cancelled so it was 102nd amendment bill but it was passed and it became 101st amendment act 2016 why because some other bills were not passed in the parliament and they did not become act that's why 102nd amendment bill it will became 101st amendment act 2016 and soon after that on 2017 march 27 cgst act sgst act igst act then gst compensation to state bill all were passed so what is this cgst sgst act igst act it will come up then all the states say so the bill act was passed then they received the assent by the majority of the state governments and slowly and on 1st july 2017 the historic indirect tax reform gst was introduced and gst so on 1st july gst was applicable to all of india except jammu and kashmir but on 8th july itself soon after one week gst was extended to jammu and kashmir also so now gst is applicable to the whole of india so this is summarized from 2000 onwards the movement till 8th july 2017 and the journey continues now <clears throat> concept of gst the main concepts the crux of this has been highlighted here was first one is value added tax so what do you mean by value added tax earlier we have seen stage there are different stages so on each stage if you see the first example regarding the purchase of dress on stage one tax is paid on thousand rupees and on stage two tax is paid on 1500 rupees and on stage three tax is paid on 2000 rupees in the example i have seen i told you that supplier paid 50 rupees as the tax and in the second stage he collected 75 rupees he kept 50 rupees into his pocket and he remitted 25 25 rupees so that means 25 rupees means 100 1000 rupees 1500 rupees so the difference so what is the value they when supplier supplied to the retailer how much is the profit he actually earned it is actually 500 rupees he purchased for 1000 and he sold it for 1500 so the profit margin or the value added at the stage 2 is actually 500 rupees and 500 into 5 percentage 25 rupees so 25 rupees is the tax added at stage 2 so at each stage tax is calculated only on the value added actually so that is the speciality of this gst gst is value added tax levied on manufacture sale and consumption 
this value added tax then second important point is continuous chain of tax credit what is this continuous chain of tax credit again another example say i am a supplier i paid 50 rupees in the stage 2 i received 75 rupees and what i did from the 75 rupees i received i adjusted the money i which i already paid that is 50 rupees and balance 25 only i remitted to the government so tax credit means whatever tax was paid by me in, st in the earlier stage it will be eligible for set off set off against amount collected in the next stage so stage one i paid 50 rupees stage two i received 75 rupees and i am able to set off this 50 rupees towards the 75 rupees and the balance 25 rupees only i required to pay to the government so that is the meaning of tax credit and this term credit tax credit income tax sorry itc input tax credit so this term we will be seeing for far more okay so continuous chain of tax credit means we can take the credit of the tax which we paid in earlier stage and we can set it off against the tax payable in the next stage then third point burden is borne by the final consumer so we know that in every stage the person who already paid tax at the earlier stage will be able, able to set it off against the tax collected so ultimately the final tax burden is always borne by the final consumer now no cascading of taxes what do you mean by cascading of taxes only value added at each stage is tax extra extra so for example since only the value added at each stage is tax from the gst there is no tax on tax or cascading of taxes under gst system cascading means tax on tax say for example earlier we had say in restaurant in restaurant what happens we purchase we go there we have food so we purchase or we receive food items and we receive service also okay so the supplier is serving us the food so there is purchase of food as well as there is service earlier they charge service charges for this service and they charged what what was actually charged on the goods actually so they charged this tax on service portion also so that means they charged a tax on one service and on that tax they charge another tax that is what so tax on tax that is actually cascading of taxes so in gst there is no cascading effects there is no tax charged on another tax so that is abolished due to gst so these are the basic fundamentals of gst one it is a value added tax two continuous chain of tax credits three burden is borne by the final consumer or there is no cascading of taxes now what is the need for gst okay why was gst required so deficiencies in the existing value added taxation led to gst it is a cure for ills of existing indian tax regime so there were many deficiencies in the earlier system so we have seen a lot of indirect taxes say VAT, CST, customs, state excise duty, central excise duty. So there were a lot of these many indirect taxes. So deficiencies in those tax systems made, forced the government to implement GST. So what were the deficiencies? One, double taxation of a transaction as both goods and service as the distinction between goods and services were often blurred example software was liable for both white and service tax in the earlier example i have given an item on that item both white is charged and service tax is charged okay so double taxation on a same transaction on a single transaction two taxes are levied 
that's actually a mis any deficiency in the earlier system. Then second one, SENVAT did not include chain of value addition in the distributive trade below the stage of production. Similarly, in state VAT, SENVAT loan on the goods was not removed, leading to cascading of taxes. So the SENVAT, we are not, uh, new students, they might not be knowing it. Say for example, excise duty, say central excise duty was levied by central government. Then service tax is levied by central government. Whereas VAT, there is something called as VAT, VAT was charged by state government. Now, we paid this central excise duty and there is actually, uh, we can take the credit of the central, uh, central taxes we paid. But we cannot set it off against the state tax payable. Okay. So, say for example, if we have a refund in central taxes and if, if we have a payable in state taxes, we are not able to set off the central tax against the state tax. So, our fund is blocked, our working capital is blocked as taxes. Now, there were several taxes in the state, such as luxury tax, entertainment tax, which are not subsumed in the VAT. Okay, so there are many taxes which are not subsumed in the sub, subsumed in the VAT regime. But whereas in when it comes to GST, there's, those were subsumed. Now, VAT on goods was not integrated with the tax on services at the state level to remove the cascading effect of service tax. With service sector being the fastest growing sector, the exclusion of services from the tax base of the states potentially eroded their tax buoyancy. This all points related to cascading effects of taxes and the setting of principle which was not levied in central government laid taxes as well as state government taxes. So it is actually summarized non inclusion of several local levies in state VAT. So these taxes were not subsumed in the state taxes. Then cascading of taxes, no send VAT after manufacturing stage. Then non integration of VAT and service tax. Then double taxation as both as goods as well as services. So these were the deficiencies of the earlier system. And now GST was introduced. This is a cure for all existing income tax regime. So all these issues has been settled due to the implementation of GST. Now we can see that framework of GST. So GST in India is actually a dual model GST. So how government simplified this tax? So how government solved this deficiencies of the earlier system? So government introduced the dual model GST. India follows dual model, model GST. So what is this dual model GST? Earlier we have seen say, say central excess duty that is levied only by central government. So the taxes levied as central, state, central excess duty will be received by central government. Now service tax it is levied by central government. Taxes received through service tax will be always with central government. Nothing will be with state government. Now VAT, VAT is levied exclusively by state government. Whatever amount is collected as VAT will be remitted to the state government only. So some taxes are paid to central government and some taxes are paid to state government. So majority of the taxes went to the central government and a few were to the state government. State government proceeded with a few revenue. Now this was sold by dual model GST. In dual model GST, for each transaction, central government and state government simultaneously levy taxes. So for each transaction, both central government and state government will levy, levy taxes. So for example, if you see 18% GST, it's actually 9% is levied by central government and 9% is levied by state government. So on each transaction or on each sale, what happens? Both central government and state government levy taxes. So this is actually known as dual model GST. 
Say for example, 18% GST, 9% goes to central government and 9% goes to state government. So how they charge this tax, that we have seen, say we have already seen something known as CGST Act, SGST Act, UTGST Act, GST Compensation to States with States Act. So I told you, we will come it in the later part. So we can charge the tax only if there is an act. So constitution has already mentioned without a proper act, nobody should levy a tax. So in order to introduce this charge, this tax, they have introduced the act. They have passed the act. So CGST act was passed. So central government, CGST, central GST act. So central government will levy a tax. SGST act was passed. Now this state GST act was passed so that state government can also levy tax. UTGST act was passed. That is Union Territory GST Act was passed, so Union Territory can pay, can charge the tax. So both central government and Union Territory will charge the tax, or both central government and state government will charge the tax. Now, the sender has also power to tax intrastate sales, and the states are also empowered to tax services. There is something known as intrastate and interstate. What do you mean by intrastate? Intrastate means within the state. Interstate means between the states. So within the state and between the states both have different meaning. So earlier we have seen service tax. Service tax is levied, was levied exclusively by the government. Now state government also can tax services. So the revenue, a share of revenue will be received by the state government. Now earlier VAT was levied only by the state government. Now the say on the same central government can also levy tax so a portion of the revenue will be received by central government also so mutually all the revenues are split split between central government and state government cgst sgst utgst igst so we have seen now we have seen a new thing what is igst so for that first we have to categorize a transaction okay so supply whether it is an interstate supply or intrastate supply. What do you mean by intrastate? Intrastate means basically within the state. Say location of supplier. So there will be a supplier, there will be a recipient, and there will be a place of supply. If the location of the supplier and the place of supply are in the same state, then it is an intrastate. So if it is in the same state, it is an intrastate. So CGST and SGST will be levied. So 9% CGST, 9% SGST. Now suppose the transaction is an interstate supply. So interstate supply, interstate supply of taxable goods or services. So in interstate supply, what happens? Say one state is actually selling, the person, a supplier of one state will be selling the goods to a recipient of another state okay so in such cases what happens is that igst is levied so there are two states involved so thereby we charge igst igst is actually levied by central government so the so for example 18 percentage igst 18 percent will be received by the central government so 18 percent is ideally 9 percent is CGST, 9 percent is gst so both will be levied by the IG central government and the tax will be remitted to the central government. And so this is actually a violation of the law because central, both state government and central government should receive the money. So what here the concept is central government will receive the money and then from the back end there will be a settlement between central government and the states. Okay, there will be a settlement between central government and state where then whereas the central government will remit the amount to state government. Now, so there are two basically intrastate supply and interstate supply. In intrastate supply, both central government and state government will be levying, CGST and SGST will be levied. And in case of interstate supply, we will be levying IGST. And the tax rate will be, say, on intrastate, it is 9% nine, 9 is CGST, 9% is SGST, totally 18%. And whereas if it is an industry supply, it will be IGST 18%.